appreciate it. So um, I, am, I was asked to speak today uh, to you about the Center for Behavioral Economics and Decision Research, but I'm happy to answer questions about any of the, the centers or institutes if you're interested. Um, does anybody know who won the Nobel Prize in the last week? Yes, very good. Uh, Thaler, uh, Richard Thaler. And he did some work at Cornell that naturally we personally feel is responsible for him getting the Nobel Prize. Well, maybe also that work he did at University of Chicago counts too. But really, he became initially quite famous for the work he did. Now, I notice some of you have cups. Now, if I randomly gave half of you a cup, a Cornell cup with a Cornell logo on it, very important cup, and the other half, I didn't give a cup, but this is random. And I asked the group that I gave the cup, tell me the number of dollars you would be willing to, to, to accept to sell this valuable cup. And I asked the other group, how much would you be willing to pay for this valuable identical cup? And it turns out, and this is the work that Thaler did at Cornell, they were Cornell cups, People are willing to um, accept $6 on average in those days for a cup, and they're willing to sell it for, um, they're willing to, to sell it for $6 and willing to accept $3. So the people without the cup value it less than the people with the cup. A person who has a cup says, I don't want to give up this cup. And it's called the endowment effect. And it's irrational because it's the identical cup. Right? So if you have the, merely placing the cup in your possession, making it your cup, makes it more valuable, like twice as much as if you don't own that cup. So when you have a free market, it's not rational. And that, of course, explains a lot about human behavior. We're not necessarily rational. There was a revolution that really was the, the behavioral economics in the title of our center was named after this field that was created at Cornell with Thaler, Robert Frank, and a variety of other uh, co-conspirators who uh, got together and really helped uh, bring the revolution from psychology in which it was demonstrated that people were not rational. They violated the axioms of economic theory. I can go into detail if you really want to be bored. Uh, but anyway, um, and we, he brought that into the business world, the finance world, personal finance, the markets, and so on. So today, for example, we have people who are looking at the brain while people trade stocks and so on and so forth in simulated kind of markets. And they show all these effects. They show bubbles. They show uh, you know, where things rise and then they crash. And people, people's brains react to all of that. Uh, so the, all of this is, is a grist for our mill here at Cornell. This is part of what we do at the Behavioral Economics and Decision Research Center. It is definitely interdisciplinary. It draws on psychology. It draws on economics, in particular behavioral economics. It draws on developmental psychology. How could that be? That's like the study of kids and old people and how life changes as you, as you go through the stages of life. But we all know that, in fact, our decisions change. How about teenagers? Do they make really good decisions? <laughs> well, some of them do. Maybe even most of them do, right? But a lot of them do. Their brains are not fully developed till they're 25. And this is where a lot of the economic decisions and attitudes and so on, social norms, become sort of crystallized as in you know, adolescence and young adulthood. We decide whether we're risk-taking or risk-avoiding, whether that's for finance or health or sports or different kinds of things. So that sets the tone for our life. Our lifestyles, in fact, are often established then. So some of our folks do research on that. Some of our folks do research on uh, little kids and how preferences and choices develop in little kids. So that's developmental. We have people who are social psychologists who are part of this center. And they study the social context, how the other people, how you appear to other people, how you compare yourself to other people, all of these things that involve uh, the social context and how that influences your decision making as well. Uh, we have people who do food decision making. You know, how do you decide? Am I going to have that? creme brulee, or am I going to have the fruit salad? Okay, or, and <clears throat> I have a little partial to the creme brulee, I have to admit, and now you have it on tape. Uh, <laughs> anyway, what about accounting? We have some wonderful people that apply. Now, accounting, I remember saying once someone, to someone in account, accounting surely is rational, right? Because you have experts, and there's dollars, and they're trained, and there's like rule books, and right? Rational. 
actually whole careers have been made by saying the opposite and showing that, that not only are people not quite rational, they're predictably irrational. Right? There's a best-selling book by Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational. So it's not just that people don't make sense, it's that they, make, they follow a, you know, the psychology of it, rather those psychological rules rather than the economic rules. And what that means, of course, is that even in accounting, you can, there's subjective judgment, there's one person audits a company and another person audits a company. It is a question of judgment, human judgment, the human judgment that can be, in fact, flawed. Right? So it, the world makes a little bit more sense. We can design things to help people uh, better. So for example, one of the applications of this research is to savings. And it is, in fact, used in the real world. If you, has anyone heard about Nudge? Nudge the book, I highly recommend the book. Uh, it's Thaler and Sunstein. Um, this is the same Thaler again. <laughs> so if you, for example, um, have people opt out of an automatic savings plan. So this is, you know, you go, you have your retirement and so on. You go to the benefits office here at Cornell. What kind of retirement do you want? How much are you going to set aside for your savings in old age, right? It turns out if you have people automatically enroll to save something, they save at a much higher rate. And, you know, that's a problem. That's the basis for the markets, it's a basis for people surviving in old age and so on and so forth. And they don't really object, you know, very few people object, maybe 10, 15 percent is according to a recent conversation I had on a plane. I the guy next to me did retirement funds and he was explaining to me how this really works, that they're now taking this, developed in a, you know, in a laboratory out into the real world with real people and he said, when I had a group that was, you know, very low paid and they said, we're sure that people are going to strongly object to this automatic opt-in kind of, you know, automatic. You can always opt out, right? So you can say, no, I don't want this. But you're, if you don't respond, you're automatically enrolled. He said, these people make so little money, they're not going to be able to get, you know, save any of it. And this is going to be, cause a big uproar in our company. No, only about 10, 15 percent of the people objected. So even though they were making very little an hour, they sort of, once it was, wasn't there, it wasn't missed as much in the day to day. But when they got older, they would have a nest egg to rely on. And this is extremely important in real life, right? Um, so that's nudge. That's the, and there are now policy agencies in Great Britain that are built on nudge and the nudge approach. And again, it's not you must, we're forcing you. It's let's go with people's inertia. You know, people have a little inertia psychologically. Let's use that with them to help them to do things that are in their self-interest. So it affects the markets, it affects foods, it affects ethical decision-making, management decision-making. We have people that study memory in decision-making, um, risky decision-making, as I mentioned, the whole gamut. And remember, behavioral economics started here. Um, let's see. Um, one of the things we're doing is we now have become an, a, re, a recognized theme in the Johnson School, and we're getting additional support for that. And again, people from all over campus are contributing. We're offering, at an overload, an extra course. Yes, we are signing up to teach extra when we don't have to, because we're all so enthusiastic about this topic, and we really are. Um, most of the folks who've been in leadership in this have very dedicated not only to graduate training but to undergraduate teaching as well. So we're going to be offering a course. We have a new postdoc that's joined us, Erica Boothby, if you happen to see her anywhere on campus. Uh, she's from Yale and she's going to be working with uh, several of us on research. And one of the reasons we want to do that is we want to um, to engage young scholars uh, in this new work and the new directions we're trying to, to go in. Let's see. So why don't I, how am I doing on time? I'm pretty good, actually. Hey, pretty good. <laughs> um, so let's see, is there anything else can, I can say? So the, one of the nice things about um, behavioral economics and decision research, and this is very important for people in, in your position, is there's deep theory here. There's mathematical theories, there's axioms, there's all of that. There's rigor, which is extremely important. We don't want to perpetrate ourselves on the public with nonsense, right? This is the whole point of a university is that we don't purvey nonsense, that we're about scientific facts and about what really does work, not what we have just as opinions and cherish uh, stereotypes and beliefs. So that's an extremely important part. But this field has always blended the kind of rigorous deep theory with the practical, the relevant. 
you know, people's actual savings, their actual health care and medical decision making, whether teenagers uh, die in a car accident because they take too many risks. So this connection is very deep and very real in this field. And I think it's extremely important because I know members of the public want relevance and they are right, of course. But without the theory and the science and the rigor and all of that, we, we have external validities, we like to say, but not internal validity, meaning that it's not necessarily true, but it's relevant. That's not good, right? It, has to, it should be true and relevant. We should be giving people advice based on what's actually the case, not, not so, just as lay people. So, so this uh, field really combines that. It has deep relevance and deep theory. And I think it's very um, ironic sometimes, but I think uh, alumni and outside people will often clamor for the rigor more sometimes than people inside. We're so worried that we're not relevant enough you know, that we sometimes think, oh, we have to, you know, lower the level of what we're doing or something like that. And I don't think the public thinks that. I think the public wants the best science. They want to make a difference in these things. They want to agitate for excellence, right? So that's what we need to continue to encourage. I think we have to explain to people how laboratory studies and then real world field studies, how they are synergistic, how they're converging operations, how we won't know how to help you if we don't do the control studies. So I think we can make the case to people. I think people are very sympathetic to that actually. We shouldn't try to say, oh, well, we don't really do any theory here or something like that. I think we can just be bold about it and, and make the case for good science because in the end that will help more people. So why don't I open it to questions? even though I know it is before lunch. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering how you engage students mm -hmm. when they, uh, the yep. work that you do in the institute. The, the sure. School. I, for example, have a fairly large laboratory that's mostly undergraduates. So we have uh, teams. We have like four or five teams. I have a medical decision-making team, a law, legal decision-making team. I study jury decision-making and adolescent plea bargaining and various things like that. And then very, uh, I have a brain team that studies the neuroscience of risky decision making. So each one of these teams has like about five undergraduates and a graduate team leader. And uh, we meet you know, on a regular basis. Um, we're coming up next week if anybody wants to come to our lab meeting. Um, so uh, we, meet, we, we also offer courses, of course, the traditional education, and we're gonna offer this new course, but we engage with students. And this is very special about Cornell. A lot of students do one-on-one -on -one type work with faculty where they really get together and do the research with them. We also do outreach and extension. And I should mention, if you need any videos, additional videos, I didn't bring a nice video like our prior speaker, but HD or Human Development Outreach and Extension has all kinds of videos. We've videotaped visiting speakers, talking, we have materials for the public. And some of our undergraduates go out into the public and deliver interventions that are based on prevention programs that are based on scientific research. So they learn by doing, but they also learn by doing research, and we try to integrate those two, and I think that's very special about Cornell. Yes? So when you are deciding on the research, are you looking for uh, real-life application, or do you do the research and then find the real life application? Me personally, I think people have different styles, but, the, but the, the style that I take is, I try to do both. I have a limited lifespan, and I have more work than I can possibly do. Um, so I think, where is the sweet spot? Where is the intersection where maybe I have an idea that's innovative, that will push the envelope, that really I have a methodological grasp of, right? And it has the most impact. So for example, I studied, um, uh, unstable angina, which is you go to the emergency room and you have chest pain, right? But it comes and it goes and so on. And why? Because if we can identify, we can help doctors make better decisions about that, it actually would have a huge effect. We, we hospitalize people that don't need to be hospitalized. We miss people that go home and die of a heart attack. If we can identify what level of risk the patient actually is at, and a lot of that had to do with the psychology of using guidelines rather than the guidelines themselves. So we had the knowledge, but people weren't implementing. So that was a psychological barrier. So I, I said, I want to study that. I don't want to study something that once you find out, there's nothing we can do. Or if we do find out, it only you know, may affect very few people. Now, some people do look at rare diseases and good for them. I think that's important too. But I look for things where I can have an intersection of my tools and the problem where they come together. I try to avoid doing trivial things. Yeah. 
you. Um, I'm Dave Taylor. I'm in external relations. I'm working with large corporations and foundations. And the foundations piece um, is interesting to me in that I, I'd like to perhaps better understand your needs, particularly as they relate to funding, what you do. Um, can you share a little bit? And just for context. I would be delighted. Yeah, and I, I'd <laughs> we like have to plenty of needs for funding. I can go right. on about that. So I'd like to come <laughs> to your lab meetings and, as well and see that. But just mm -hmm. for context, I also teach during the summer and I introduced Dan Ariely's uh, Predictably te rational. TED Talk and um, I'm familiar with the endowment effect and the mental accounting and, and Tversky mm -hmm. and Kahneman's prospect theory. So I understand that context. But tell me a little bit more about the money and the needs. Mm -hmm. Well, we have needs that range from summer fellowships for undergraduates. You know, sometimes our undergraduates would like to stay at Cornell and really get an in-depth, I mean, it's lovely here in the summer. They really can focus. They're not, you know, pulled in many, many different directions. It's actually a very, and they will typically tell me at the end of a summer when they're able to stay that it really made a difference to them. Um, they, they grow just in a couple of months. It's amazing as people, both as, and as researchers. So summer fellowships for undergraduates are fantastic. Uh, graduate fellowships are extremely important for graduate students. Often graduate students will have teaching assistantships in addition to taking classes and in addition to doing their dissertation research. And a graduate research fellowship enables them, again, to focus, oh, wow, you know, time enough to think and really bring things together. And this is particularly important when people are doing innovative work. If you're not just, if you're not just doing the cookie cutter, I'm going to replicate something that's been done a million times, you're trying to do original work and really push the field forward, you really need to focus and have time to think. And there's so much bureaucracy nowadays, and, so, and that takes away your time, it takes away your time. And so finally you're left with this you know, 10 minutes with no sleep kind of situation. So graduate fellowships are really good. I think teaching experience is fabulous, but often by the time a student really would benefit from this, they've had a lot of teaching experience as a grad student. So um, that's really, so and those are not, you know, incredibly enormous, but they make a huge difference in the life of that person. Um, let's see, uh, we have, uh, you know, we want to send undergraduates to conferences. I just uh, came back from a conference, the Society for Neuroeconomics, and I brought, you know, three students, actually they brought themselves, they drove from, it was in Toronto. We drove to save money so we would have enough money so that we could support other students to go to other conferences. So they all drove together in the same car. It was three undergraduates and they stood next to their posters, at, at their two posters, uh, one on concussions by the way, and the effects of concussions on impulsivity in, in student athletes. Um, and the other one was on risk taking, including criminal risk taking and how that uh, covarious with certain uh, activation in the brain. And they did a magnificent job. Everybody thought they were at least doctoral students. They had the nice suits on and they were just incredibly well prepared. And I'm so proud of them. But we really, literally, I, I, I worry about whether my printer is the cheapest possible printer so I can buy cartridges that are the cheapest possible cartridges so I can save a couple hundred dollars to send students to conferences, literally. I actually spend my time on that. What would you like to know about printers? I, I, I mean it. I, I really, I actually have to worry. I count the pennies because I only can make them go so far. Um, so those kinds of things are extremely helpful. We would love to do more in the community, but it's transportation. I have to get people from point A. You know, when they invent, they perfect that beam me up, Scotty thing, I'm going to be so happy because right now, literally, we have students who are willing. We have, I'm, I'm the outreach coordinator also <laughs> in my department, in my spare time, and because I really believe in outreach and extension. Um, and, uh, you know, it really had a lot to do with my background. My parents did not go to, you know, college or anything like that. And I think we really do have to give back. And the students are willing and enthusiastic about it, but we have to get them from Ithaca to other places. And that takes money. And if they have to stay overnight, now we're into a really big ticket item. So literally things like that make a huge difference. Um, in uh, you know the the well-being of students, and I should say all of the other folks, in the, and you'll see some of them in this HD outreach extension materials on our website. <laughs> There's videos, and I, but all, everyone in this center, and there's people from different colleges here. There's from the Johnson School, but also <clears throat> many other colleges here that are represented. People who do consumer finance, how do people budget, um, and may, and pay their bills. They all, I'm sure, would have very similar stories and could use support. 
competitor, or would he say, I got my start at Cornell, or my former colleagues at Cornell were the originators of this school of thought? I'm thinking in terms of the endorsement value mm -hmm. of a Nobel Prize winner saying, you guys are doing really important work. You know, that shines a light on you from a fundraising standpoint yes. that you can't really diminish. Well, we've actually had him back. I, in fact, debated him. Uh, then we have that, I think, on tape. Uh, in, um, uh, so he's been supportive, and he continues to be. And in fact, Bill Schultz, in the latest issue of Science Magazine, who's Bill Schultz is part of this uh, center, and he's an uh, experimental economist, behavioral economist. He's one of the pioneers also. He was the first person quoted saying how much Thaler deserved the Nobel. Uh, prize for this. So, yes, I think that would be very helpful with great advice. We, I love advice, by the way. Please help us with advice. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Given your interest in the, the nature, I think, of, the, of Ithaca and the city of Ithaca, particularly with the mayor right now, um, have you guys done a lot of work um, with your students and, and reaching out to the public? I mean, there's been such a push about, I mean, and a lot of controversy over the mayor's stance on drugs and usage and addiction, as well as mental health, and um, that's on a national stage, but even just in the bubble of Ithaca, it, it's even walk, so it's not. I'm yes. Just well, we do. In fact, uh, we we uh, we have regularly have um, programs at Ithaca High School. We try to do 4-H. Uh, we do youth programs in in the community and so on. Um, again, through extension and other means, we we contact all kinds of agencies. If there are agencies that you think would benefit, we'll come in and do the work and do the evaluation and everything uh, for these programs. We're just happy to get people to to work with us. Um, the, uh, so we do a lot of that, actually, um, in the community. Um, we're part of Engaged Cornell. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, and we really appreciate the support that's been available from that as well. When did the team start coming together under BEDR? And when, um, you know, as, as a formal entity or group, and then what do you see as the goal of what should look different two years and five years from now? Mm -hmm. Ah, hard question. Okay. <laughs> It, it actually got together at the time of Thaler and so on. So years ago, we're reorganizing now uh, because we have new support, and we thank the Johnson School for that support. And we also had contributions from a variety of deans as well, all putting together. This is really one of those wonderful, magical things where people from different colleges can come together, and I, I think that's really wonderful. In two years and five years, um, I, I would like to see us have some sustaining support I would like us to be able to support uh, postdoctoral fellows that would rotate around uh, the different colleges and be a bridge among the colleges and be, uh, and be out there successful, uh, leading the charge for a new way of doing uh, the work that we do. Um, I think, you know, if we had people, undergraduates, who took this course and were able to use that in their personal life, their personal happiness, their financial well-being, their health well-being. Um, and I'm not just, you know, there are actual studies showing that these kinds of things do pay off in these very practical ways. Um, numeracy, the ability to use and understand numbers, is related to diabetic medication management. So, you know, knowledge really makes a difference. It really does. And decision making and, and about life decision making is important. So I would love to see those kinds of uh, indirect effects on people's well-being. Um, and, you know, I would love to see Cornell once again be the place where innovative new things start. Uh, there's some new perspectives that several of us have, uh, not only involving the brain but human behavior, that really are the next generation. I was the postdoctoral uh, fellow for Tversky of Tversky and Kahneman. So, you know, sort of a <laughs> part of this tradition. Uh, and a number of people here studied with these folks. Uh, but the, it's time for really a new generation of scholars that honors the old but then goes in new directions. I think Cornell really could be outside the box um, in ways that other more stodgy places um, will not be. Um, and I, I would love to see that, that there really was a new wave of new thinking uh, about judgment and decision making. Thank you so much. <laughs>